In the previous lecture, I defined what is regional economic integration and, and we also looked at the different degrees of economic integration starting from preferential trade arrangements or trading arrangements. The countries can move to free trade area and then to customs union and then we have the common market and then the economic union. So we know all these definitions. Now let us look at the benefits and costs involved with a country signing a free trade agreement with its neighbors. And let us look at the following example. Consider the following diagram where we are looking at the demand for imports of cars by the US. So we are looking at everything from the US perspective. And on the horizontal axis, what we have is number of cars imported by the US. And on the vertical axis, we have the price of each unit of car. Suppose there are two producers of cars, one called Japan and the other one called Mexico. Japan produces and is willing to export this car for $15,000 per car exported. And Mexico, on the other hand, can export a same or similar car for $18,000. And so if we have free trade, the, what the U.S. citizens will do is they will buy cars which come from Japan. Why? Because these two countries produce the same or similar car and Japanese cars are $3,000 cheaper than the Mexican cars. So we have this. So what U.S. will do is at a price of $15,000, it will import 20,000 cars and all of them will come from Japan. Now suppose the U.S. imposes a tariff of $5,000 per unit of car imported into the U.S. And so the price of Japanese cars to the American consumers will become $20,000. And this line reflects Japan plus the tariffs imposed by the U.S. The Mexican car, since they face the same tariff as we have for Japan, the landed cost of the Mexican car will be 18,000 plus 5,000, so which will be 23,000. That's something I've not shown in terms of this diagram. So if the U.S. imposes a tax or a tariff of $5,000 per car imported, what will happen? This is the price which will be paid by U.S. consumers. And at this price, given the demand for imports, how many units of cars will be imported into the U.S.? 10,000 and all of them will come from Japan. Now let us calculate the total surplus, consumer surplus, and so on. So these letters represent the area in which they are written. So D is the area of this triangle. A represents the area of this rectangle, similarly B, and then you have these other letters which simply represent the area in which they are placed, area of the diagram in which they are placed. Now let us compare the consumer or the total surplus when we had free trade and Americans were buying Japanese cars for $15,000. Based on our earlier discussion of consumer surplus, we know this area of this entire triangle, this entire triangle will be the extent of consumer surplus or the additional benefit that has been acquired by consumers who are purchasing the Japanese cars. So what will be the area of this triangle under free trade? It will be A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. So this is 
the amount of total surplus that accrues to the U.S. when we have free trade. Now, when U.S. imposes a tariff of $5,000, the price paid by the U.S. consumer is $20,000 and $10,000 units of cars are imported. What will be the extent of consumer surplus when they pay a price of $20,000? It will be the area of this triangle represented by letter D. So consumer surplus with tariffs will be D. Then we'll have E plus B. This whole thing will represent the tariff revenue which stays with the U.S. government. And so how much will this be? This will just be the area of this rectangle. So tariff revenue will be A plus B. So what is the total surplus when U.S. imposes a tariff of $5,000? The total surplus will be the sum of D, A, and B. Now look at the following. We move from a position of free trade to one of tariff and now the US decides to sign a free trade agreement with Mexico. So what this means in terms of prices is the following. Mexico can export its car for $18,000 to the American consumers. What about the Japanese cars? Because Japan is not a member of this free trade arrangement. There is a tariff on Japanese cars, which is $5,000. So Japanese cars cost $20,000 to the U.S. consumers. And with free trade arrangement with Mexico, Mexican cars cost $18,000. So now what the U.S. consumers will do is, instead of buying the Japanese car, they will start to buy cars produced in Mexico. And so at $18,000, how many cars will be imported from Mexico? It will be 15,000 cars. And all the cars purchased by Americans will be coming from Mexico. So when we have a free trade arrangement with Mexico, what is the extent of consumer surplus? It will be given by the area of this triangle, which is essentially D plus A plus C. And so consumer surplus or total surplus when we have a regional trading arrangement like a free trade arrangement with Mexico, the total consumer surplus will be D plus A plus C. Now when you rank different alternatives, we already know that the best solution is just having free trade and no tariffs or no agreement with Mexico. But let us compare what is called the theory of second best. We compare a situation of tariffs with having a regional trade arrangement with Mexico. So the total surplus under tariff is D plus A plus B. And total surplus when we have a regional trading arrangement with Mexico is D plus A plus C. So let us look at the difference between total surplus when we have a free trade arrangement with Mexico and total surplus when we have tariff, D and A will cancel out and what we are left with is C minus B or this area C and minus B. So when tariffs are in place and we sign an agreement, free trade agreement with Mexico, there is certain amount of benefit which accrues to the US and this is captured in terms of area of the triangle represented by C and this C is called trade creation. It's an extra benefit and then we lose the amount of tariff revenue which is denoted by the area of this rectangle represented by B and this part is called trade diversion. So when tariffs are in place and we sign a free trade agreement with one country or some countries, there's certain amount of extra benefit derived 
and this is called trade creation. Then we also lose a certain amount of benefit and this is called trade diversion. So we know that the benefit that emerges by signing a free trade agreement is called trade creation and the loss incurred because of signing a free trade agreement is called trade diversion and here are the formal definitions. Trade creation is an expansion in world trade that results from the formation of free trade agreement. And what is trade diversion? It's a shift in the pattern of trade from low cost producer, in our case Japan, to a higher cost producer within a member country. And for us, it is Mexico. So you should know the difference between trade creation and trade diversion. And so when we have a free trade arrangement, idea is to get the maximum benefit by signing the free trade agreement. Or what we need is the difference between trade creation and trade diversion should be as large as possible, or trade creation should be higher and trade diversion should be low. Here is a list of conditions under which we may have higher welfare gains because of signing of free trade agreement. And what we need is a more trade creation and less trade diversion. The first point should be pretty obvious and that is higher the pre-union trade barriers amongst member nations, the better off it is. Why? Because when you eliminate trade barriers, you're going to see a larger benefit. The second reason for this is in order to minimize trade diversion is that we should have had lower trade barriers with the rest of the world before signing the agreement. The third condition is the more members we have as a part of this agreement, the better off we are. The fourth condition is interesting and that is members or countries that want to become members, they should be more competitive rather than complementary. For example, it makes sense for US to sign an agreement with a country which is very similar and that is uh, if U.S. is an industrialized country, it should sign an agreement with an industrialized country rather than an agriculture country. So it makes sense for the U.S. to sign agreement with Mexico and Canada, but not with, say, an agriculture dominated country. The fourth or the fifth, sorry, the fifth reason for this is the members should be close enough in terms of geographical location or they should be neighbors or close to one another. Why? Because simply it will cut down on transportation cost. And the last reason, again, this is important. The greater is the pre-union trade and economic relations among potential members, the better off it is in terms of welfare gains when we sign a trade agreement. So this completes this video lecture. Thank you for your time.